Welcome back to the SpongeBob SquarePants Season 1 Review Slash Retrospective. Today we're going to be diving into Episode 3. Episode 3 being where I feel the series is really starting to come into its own and make its legendary status that it's known for today. Episode 3 contains two episodes. You've got 3A, which is jellyfishing, and 3B, which is plankton, being a character introductory episode and probably one of the best ones. So, let's dive into these individually like we have been with the past two episodes, and I'm going to talk a little bit about each one. I don't really have anything bad to say about either. They're both really good. I think this is the best of the series yet, as of leading up to this point. The series has been good, but this is where the series becomes great. So, we'll start with... 3A, which is jellyfishing, the basic premise, Spongebob and Patrick are jellyfishing, we get introduced to what it is, we were introduced to it previously in Tea at the Tree Gnome, but in this episode it gets a name, and we see that Spongebob and Patrick really enjoy it, it's probably their favorite hobby, Squidward ends up getting roped into it, and everybody ends up getting hurt in the end, that's the basic summary of the episode, and it is... It sounds simplistic, and that's just because I'm giving a basic overall spoiler-free summary, or relatively spoiler-free summary, the, to the best of my ability, but if I had to sum it up, that's basically what it is, and while that might not sound terribly exciting, it is... The, the jokes, the timing, the characterizations, all of these are so, so good. You get a real feel for these characters here. You get a feel for Spongebob and Patrick and their whimsical nature. You get a feel for Squidward's grouchiness. And you really feel bad for Squidward because in this episode, he's really doing all of this against his will. Because he's in a body cast. He ends up in a body cast due to an accident that he has. So he ends up going uh, jellyfishing with Spongebob and Patrick in a body cast and in a wheelchair. So he can't really get away. And I think that brings a lot of humor to the episode. It's very well voice acted. Uh, we get introduced to Jellyfish Fields as a location. Again, they're really making Bikini Bottom seem like a varied location and not the same static locations over and over and over again. Although you can be creative while doing that, they've really made Bikini Bottom into its own society, f complete with areas of recreation and business and all sorts of things, and I really, really love that about Spongebob, is that Bikini Bottom is varied, and they've continued to add to it in newer episodes, that's the one thing I will give newer episodes credit for, is they continue to add more locations and things to flesh out the world, so that's really, really cool in my opinion. Um, very straightforward, again, this follows the formula of something like Bubble Stand, that is very well established there, but it, it expands on it in ways that are very good. There's a lot more slapstick humor. There's a lot of funny one-liners. There's a lot of just funny visual gags. It's just, it's funny all around, and it's a, it's a solid episode. Again, this is where the series starts to really feel funny, and you're laughing more than anything else. So, Jellyfishing is a solid episode, definitely a 10 out of 10 for me, I really like it, uh, it's not the last time we see Jellyfishing in the series, it becomes sort of a staple. A lot of this in the first season is establishing a lot of staples for the series going forward, and this is yet another one. And speaking of establishing staples, we'll move on to episode 2B, or 3B, or 3 not to be which is Plankton, and it is a character introduction episode. So. The basic summary of the episode, Spongebob is working, doing his fry cooking thing, which he is spectacular at, and Plankton appears to try to steal a Krabby Patty. They don't know it's him at first, but Krabs reveals him, and he reveals the fact that he's basically been trying for years and failing. So we get introduced to this character. He's just a little villainous microorganism. And a funny thing about this is that going forward, Plankton as a character, they actually had to scale him up size-wise, because in this episode, he's almost microscopic. In fact, he's portrayed pretty much as microscopic. But according to the voice actor, Doug Lawrence, he said that basically, in future episodes, if they want him to interact with the world and the characters, it didn't make sense for him to be microscopic. He had to be of a bigger size. So they made him, I want to say, roughly the size of... Uh, 
It's hard to say. Maybe like a like a hamster. I would say if a hamster was standing up, that'd be as big as he is. It may be slightly smaller than that, somewhere in between. But he's definitely not microscopic anymore. He's more the size of a, a large bug. Although I think they continue to scale him up in later seasons, I can't really remember, so it's kind of hard to get a gauge for his size. But it's funny because something like that you would think might ruin the character, and surprisingly it doesn't. Surprisingly, he's still an enjoyable character. So, but in this episode, he stays pretty much microscopic, and he, he has a huge presence in this episode. I mean, he just... Doug Lawrence absolutely knocks his character out of the park. We feel his his whimsical, evil-like nature as a character, his villainous nature, but he's also a complete goofball and a com complete moron in many ways, and he just... He fails at almost every endeavor he undertakes, and that becomes a series staple as him trying to repeatedly steal the Krabby Patty secret formula and fail. And it's something that, honestly, I felt bad for the character. I really wanted to see him succeed. In, in almost every effort, it kind of became a Roadrunner and Coyote type thing, which I'm sure it was largely inspired by. You know, him trying to constantly steal this formula with all sorts of gadgets and scientific plans. And in this episode, he tries to take control of SpongeBob's brain to get him to not only make him a Krabby Patty, but also deliver it to him at his restaurant, the Chum Bucket, which is another established location. Which, in the continuity... The Chum Bucket is usually directly across from the Krusty Krab, and there's a street dividing the two, but sometimes it's a little further down the street, or sometimes, I don't know, it's it's very, it's very inconsistent with where it is, but it is another established location, it's established that it's a restaurant that nobody eats there because it's Chum, and if you know anything about what Chum is, why would citizens of Bikini Bottom ever eat that is beyond me, aside from maybe sharks. That's the funny thing, is you'd think he would have a lot of shark and predatory customers, but... No, he doesn't. And it's revealed in later seasons why he serves Chum the way that he does. But as of right now, it's really not. So, it's just, it's a very, very solid episode. This one has, for me, some of the most memorable jokes in the series. And there is one joke in this that I think is one of the best jokes in the entire series. And it takes place when Plankton is awkwardly controlling Spongebob, getting him to walk, and he ends up smashing through Squidward's house. Squidward is woken up and is confused as to what he's doing. He's trying to get his attention. He's completely ignoring him. Uh, Spongebob turns around with a scowl on his face, and Plankton takes control of his voice, and he absolutely eviscerates Squidward. He insults him to a degree I didn't think was possible in a kid's show. It is one of the funniest jokes I have ever seen, and it's incredibly simplistic, but the way that it's written and the way that it's acted by Doug Lawrence is, oof, what a phenomenal joke. Absolutely phenomenal, and it is the highlight of the episode for me. Both Squidward's reaction and the way it's delivered, oh, it is just, it's hysterical to me. It really is. The whole episode feels that way. It really does. And it's it's very, very funny, and it's very solid. And it, it establishes, once again, another running trope of the series of Plankton constantly coming up with evil schemes to try to steal the secret formula and failing. And by the way, in the movie which I guess is non-canon, he succeeds, at least temporarily. And I remember as a kid watching it, and I wasn't that young, I was probably like 12, 13. I remember being happy for him, because he's failed so many times. It's like, yes, finally, he gets it. But of course, it's the movie, so it's not terribly well established that that's in any sort of canon. So... But it was nice to see him sort of kind of get what he's been after all of these years. But in this episode, it's just the whole trope is basically just getting started, even though it was happening before SpongeBob worked at the Krusty Krab. So it is what it is. But it's it's a phenomenal, phenomenal character episode. It, I love the character of Plankton. 
I think he's been one of the most consistent characters throughout the years. In some ways he hasn't, but in most ways he has. They've kept his character largely the same. It's just, like with most characters in the newer seasons, they dial up their personality traits to 11, and it becomes something that you definitely notice later on, where it's like Plankton is evil, but now he's like just maniacal in these in these other episodes, so... And you can argue that started with the movie. The movie, I think, started a lot of the changes that we now know to the characters in many ways. I think the movie definitely played everything up because it's a theatrical production. So you could probably trace most of the changes. I made a video talking about this uh, old versus new SpongeBob. It's up on the channel. And I didn't really talk about the movie very much in that, but I thought I'd fill it in here because we're talking about Plankton and his characterization. I think his character becomes more toned up by the movie. You know, before that, it's pretty consistent throughout. But um, he is a fun character. I really do like him. And I think that as a whole, he's a good villain for the series. The series doesn't really need a villain per se, but if it has to have one, Plankton is definitely the one that it should have. He is definitely the perfect fit for this show because he has ambitions that are relatively harmless, but he also has world domination ambitions, you know? So in the end, he's a good solid character because he's not really a threat to anybody. He, he just, he gets into mischief and scheming, but he's not a serious threat to any of the citizens. Every once in a while, he'll do something that causes some sort of mischief, and in spin-off materials, he'll do stuff, like in Battle for Bikini Bottom, he creates a bunch of robots to try and steal the formula, and they end up running amok, and uh, in uh, the Operation Krabby Patty video game, I think he also creates some sort of soldiers, and a robot crabs to try and steal the formula and that all goes awry so he's not really a terrible threat everything he does pretty much fails and you can't help but sympathize for him sometimes because everything that he does ends up failing you can't help but feel like oh boy i wish this guy would just succeed in some way you know it's it's really kind of sad so in the end he ends up uh he ends up failing in hilarious fashion, the Krabby Patty secret formula doesn't end up being revealed. It ends up just going back with SpongeBob, and it, it sets a great precedent for episodes going forward. And it might not sound like these two being establishing episodes for one for jellyfishing and one for the character of Plankton are very interesting, but trust me, if you haven't seen these episodes, you absolutely need to, especially if you're going through the series chronologically, which I would recommend for new viewers, because if you jump into a new season, I think you're just going to be a little bit lost, and maybe you get the wrong impression of why people like the show. But if you're watching chronologically, you definitely want to pay attention to the aspects of who these characters are, how they were established, and what their tropes are, and this is a great establishing character-slash-trope episode for sure. Both episodes are very, very solid. I don't think I... I think I slightly prefer Plankton to Jellyfishing, but it's not by much. It really isn't. They Both episodes are good. It's it's not to the point where it's like, oh, I like the A episode, but the B episode's weak, or I like the B episode, but the A episode's kind of weak, and I had to just kind of sit through it. Uh, that doesn't start to happen until later seasons for me. But for this episode, in this season, both episodes are incredibly solid. I can watch them both all the way through. I think they're incredibly watchable, digestible for both kids and adults. I don't think the humor is too over the top. I think it's very balanced, very well timed. Both make decent use of slapstick and other visual gags, and they're very well voice acted. The voice acting doesn't at all feel over the top. Even Plankton, for being a villainous character who you would think would be over the top, is very measured, very controlled, very well acted. He's got a great evil laugh. He's just really, really a good character. I really like the character of Plankton in this, and I like him throughout the series going forward. He's one of the characters in newer seasons I have the least problems with, even though, again, his traits are turned up. They... He is so consistent and so well done that I really, really like him. But, um, yeah, overall, these are these are a solid group of episodes, or just one episode. 
I'm starting to, can you tell I'm running out of things to say, honestly, because they're just, they're so good, they're really just so good, there's not a whole lot else to say, I mean, there's, there's really no downside, I can't think of even anything in the animation that's really very bad, uh, Jellyfish Fields looks awesome, it's got a whole lot of cliffs and more sandy slash grassy areas, but it's more like a natural park, which is really cool. It, it look, it's like a preserve where people can just go and either watch them or try to catch and release jellyfish. It's really cool. And seeing jellyfish being more developed because the original jellyfish design was more realistic and it wasn't very interesting. But these ones, they're pink and they've got dark pink spots on them. And it's really just... It's cool. It's more world building. You know, these are, and they're, they're kind of supposed to be portrayed like bees, where they, they, uh, kind of flutter around in, uh, swarms, and we see this even later on in this season, how they're more bee-like. They even have hives that they go into, so, I mean, it's really cool. It's really awesome to see this world coming to life before your eyes, you know? And even as a kid seeing it for the first time, it's like, oh, hey, I'm not familiar with this world, but I'm becoming familiar with this world. So it's it's really, really cool. But yeah, Jellyfish Fields is really neat. Uh, Chum Bucket's neat, although we don't spend a whole lot of time in it. It's pretty consistent in terms of its interior. You know, just the Krusty Krab is fairly inconsistent in its interior. But the Chum Bucket has been, almost since day one, it's had almost the same decor, and a lot of the interior has stayed the same. You know, a lot of times in cartoons, you won't see consistent interiors in repeat locations. You'll see stuff moved around a lot, you'll see rooms added and taken away, but the Chum Bucket has stayed largely the same. It's got the whole front seating area, and then the whole back area is plankton's laboratory slash kitchen if you want to call it that and that's actually really neat that they've been able to do that and they've paid that much attention to consistency throughout the episode i think that's a really neat little feature that not many people might notice but they they have done that and they've done that with the crusty crab as well for the most part even though they've added and taken away rooms it's been consistently the same thing you've got the open dining room and then on the far right hand side you have the bathrooms and storage and then in the middle you have the kitchen which is towards the back and then on the far left you have Krabs' office which also goes into the kitchen and it's been pretty consistent throughout and that's that's something crazy when you think how long this show has been running they could very easily change up the continuity but they really haven't to the to that degree they've added and taken away like one or two rooms in the crusty crab but other than that, I can't think of anything too wildly inconsistent, other than maybe Patrick's Rock. Sometimes it's portrayed as just having a flat sand bottom. Other times, he's dug out out of sand an entire living area underneath. And uh, that's been inconsistent. More, more recently, it's been, you know, a whole big area that he's dug out. And I think they did that so that it looks like he has more of a home than just laying under a rock. So, uh... That's neat, but with the Chum Bucket in particular, it's been very consistent. And again, in this episode, we don't spend a whole lot of time there. It's just established that it is a place, it is there, and it is a cool design for a restaurant. A bucket with a big old glove handle on it. It looks like something that fell into the ocean and was retrofitted into a restaurant. That's one of the coolest things. Kind of like the Krusty Krab is a lobster trap that probably fell into the ocean and got retrofitted into a restaurant. And SpongeBob's pineapple. Somebody dropped a pineapple into the ocean. Or Squidward's um, Easter Island head. You know? Patrick's rock is just a rock, but they all look like objects. Like, even the regular houses look like a bunch of mufflers that fell into the ocean. Like, just trash that fell in and was retrofitted into homes. So, it's really, really a cool world to live in. And I think it would be a cool world to live in if it was real, but... It's a cool world to look at. It's a fun world to look at. I really like that. But uh, I'm, I'm running out of things to say, honestly. It's just good. I don't have anything bad to say. Really, I don't. There's no weak, weak spots in this episode. They don't feature a lot of other characters. I mean, 
Jellyfishing just features the, the main neighbor trio of SpongeBob, Patrick, and Squidward, and then Plankton features crabs briefly, Squidward briefly, but it's mostly SpongeBob and Plankton, and then that's pretty much it. Squidward probably has a little bit more than crabs, because uh, we see him again, but it's primarily SpongeBob and Plankton, and we get introduced to Plankton's computer wife, Karen, although she's not established as that, I think, until, I think, maybe two episodes later. Either way, she becomes another staple character, and they give her a lot more characterization in the newer seasons. But we're, we're seeing this world come to life, and we're seeing the style of humor come to life, although I would argue that that starts to change, and that's hit or miss, but for now, you can enjoy what the series is becoming and what it's establishing. And I can't wait to do episode four, so that is going to do it for me here for this retrospective, and I will see you guys in the next one. This has been Super Koopa. Hope you enjoyed. God bless. Have a good one. Peace.